Um, so the way cocaine works is it allows time to be longer. So it gets rid of the uh, component of the neurotransmitter that recycles cocaine, so it sits in that little synaptic cleft longer. So cocaine prolongs dopamine being there. That's why cocaine works. Um, heroin is a slightly different pathway, but the bottom end of the day, what it does is it just produces more dopamine in the body. I'm not going to do this for all drugs, but most every single drug is increasing the amount of dopamine in your brain. The problem is, the problem with a dopamine of 350 or 500 or 1300 is the brain thinks that is crazy, right? It is not meant to ever be that much dopamine in your brain. Your brain is supposed to maybe get a peak of 200, right? Great sex plus chocolate cake. Maybe you got yourself to 220. I have no idea. But the point is, is that when the brain starts to see these huge levels of dopamine, it says something's wrong here. I need to quiet it down. I need to turn down this very loud volume. So I'm going to do one of three things. I'm going to stop producing dopamine. I'm going to take away the receptors for dopamine, or I'm going to increase my recycler. So I'm going to suck the dopamine back out of the synaptic cleft faster. That's what the brain does to fix that loud level of dopamine. And with somebody with an addiction, um, you have a baseline that's a little bit different. You get high, you crash way down, way below where you ever wanted to be. So most people who are struggling actively with the disease of addiction are having dopamine levels on a daily basis that are probably 30 to 50. It's hard to get out of bed and get showered and show up at your doctor appointment on time and actually be nice to your probation officer or be nice to my office staff when your dopamine level is 30. You're actually pretty mean and unpleasant a lot of the time, not just because you're withdrawal, but because you feel terrible. Your brain feels terrible and you will do anything to improve upon that. People with an alcohol addiction have a little bit of dopamine going on because alcohol actually interacts with GABA, a slightly different neurotransmitter, but the rest of those brains are not experiencing much dopamine release. But part of the brain is being impacted, right? And what does it mean long term for those brains, particularly today's marijuana, which is not what people were smoking in the 1970s. Um, uh, alcohol, barbiturates, benzodiazepams. Massachusetts is the number four prescriber of benzodiazepams. Drugs like Valium, Xanax, clona clonazepam, also called clonopin, Ativan, number four prescriber in the country. We hand out benzos like crazy and we're at, we act like it's no big deal, but they are very dependency inducing drugs and they're very hard to get off of. The woman on the other hand is a young woman who overdoses. She's given Narcan in the field. She revives for a while. She crashes again. She's on the ambulance. She's given Narcan again in the ER. They hold her for four hours. They ask her if she wants treatment. They have crisis come over and evaluate her. There's no real beds available. There's no detox beds. There's no 21-day beds. There's no long-term beds. They don't call primary care. They don't call her therapist. They don't offer her any other treatment options. So she goes back out within half a day, and she's using again. What happens, though, with addiction is that once you get rid of one addiction, the way the brain works, because again, all of these same chemicals are all rotating through the same uh, reward center in the brain. Once you get rid of something, something else will often take its place. So for just a minute, if you look at alcohol and you stop drinking alcohol because you decide you're struggling with alcohol, you often will develop a disease of addict addiction to something else. So any AA meeting, what are people struggling with at most AA meetings? Some of which are bad for you, some of which are not. Smoking, right? There's a high preponderance of nicotine abuse, okay? Uh, what else is there? Coffee, caffeine. Caffeine is an addiction. Is it terrible for you? No, actually caffeine's probably good for you. The studies look at four to five eight ounce cups a day as being actually healthful, longer, lowest rates of mortality with four to five eight ounce cups a day. So caffeine is an addiction that I guess could lead you down the bad path if you really, really, really drink too much, but for the most part, it's not that bad. And then the third one that I think of, sugar. Wow, you guys are good. So there's your little sugar addiction, um, gambling addiction, sex addiction. The addiction could be any, anything that you, that you want it to be. And um, I'm going to just put this slide up. I'm not going to go through this slide. This is the American Society of Addiction Medicine's um, definition of addiction. It's um, way too long. But what I, I want to point out is that genetics account for 50% of addiction development. So the average parent who's suffering, struggling with an addiction, whether it's to alcohol or to something else, 50% of the time that will be passed on to their kids. There is no disease you guys could name that has that level of genetic predisposition. Nothing. Nothing. 
Um, a history of trauma or stressors that overwhelm an individual's coping abilities. That's very, very common with this disease. The, often the presence of a co-occurring psychiatric illness. When you ask the average teenager, like, why, why did you start? They'll often say, I felt so terrible, I was so depressed, or my anxiety was so bad that this is the thing that made me feel normal. And then the final is just the impaired executive function so that perception, learning, impulse control, compulsivity, and judgment are impaired. It's part of the disease. So we can all get really mad at somebody who relaxes, or you could take a deep breath and say, wow, this is part of the disease, and I'm going to work with it. They started using their first drug at seven, eight, or nine. And I'm not talking small amounts. They started drinking vast amounts of alcohol, vast amounts of marijuana or nicotine at seven, eight, and nine, right? That's third, fourth, and fifth grade. So look at how high those numbers get in those adolescent years. And in fact, all addiction starts in adolescence. It's just to help all of us get better. So that is actually, I think, the end of my talk.